And I came and I looked at this camera, and the camera was startling to me. It was a Sony Portapac. And the Sony Portapac was very small, lightweight camera. And people could shoot with that who didn't need to be a professional. And people could p carry it around. They wouldn't didn't need large boxes and large crates. And what was interesting about it was that it took care of a whole riff of pr possibilities because it meant that people could have their own voice. At that time, there were three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. That's it. And to get access to them was ridiculous. You couldn't. Suddenly came this camera, and I thought, wow, this has such possibilities, I can't stand it. So I, kept, so I came back, and I kept hanging around looking at this camera. And this friend of mine said, why don't you go talk to David Oppenheim? And I said, about what? And she said, well, if you don't know, I can't tell you. So I've made the appointment, and don't embarrass me. And I said, who is David Oppenheim? Well, it turns out that David Oppenheim was one of the most wonderful men I've ever met. And I came to see him, and I walked in the door, and he said, yes. And I looked at him, and I said, I don't know why I'm here. I'm embarrassed to be here, but the appointment was made, and I had to fill it. So he said, well, that's interesting. Why don't you tell me something about what you do? So I told him I had once a long time ago been at the National Film Board of Canada and that I had been looking at this camera, and I was fascinated with this camera. And he said, well, seems to me that might be an interesting thing for you to do. Why don't you just go down, Haig Mnugin is the chairman of the department, why don't you just go down and sort of hang around and see what you find? So I said, I can't walk into a department. <laughs> Who would take it? And what happened was, I did do it. I found myself doing it. I found myself integrating myself with all the film people, but I wasn't interested in film, I was interested in the tape. And setting up the first video department at the School of the Arts. But just doing it. George Stoney had come from the National Film Board where I actually had been trained. And he taught this first, very first video class. And he asked me if I would like to take the students and go out on community projects. Well, that's what I really wanted, and I said, sure. And so I went out there. By the way, I was paid $1,500 for the year. But I didn't care about the money. I wasn't interested in the money. That was only one year. <laughs> the next year, I gained uh, 15000 which was... <laughs> quite, a, quite a raise, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that was because I raised the money. Anyway, the interesting part of the story is that I worked with the students. The students shot a video of a street corner that needed a traffic light. And they couldn't get the city to listen. So I said, let's go shoot the city. Let's go shoot the light. So they shot the light. They took this video down to City Hall, somehow got an audience, showed the tape, and they got a light. So this was really empowering. And this really convinced me that this had a lot of, a lot of legs. And I gave a presentation somewhere, and a man came up to me afterwards and said, I'd like to talk to you about this. And I said, sure, and I put the card in my pocket. Forgot about it, and several weeks later, I guess it was uh, George Stoney again, asked me if I knew where he could get money to make a film on ecology. And I said, I don't know, but this guy gave me his card. I'll call him. So I called him. And I said, do you remember me? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, would you be interested in funding a film on ecology? He said, no. So I said, as any good interrogator would say, what are you interested in? And he said, I'm interested in what you're talking about, how you see this developing. And on the spot, I just made it up as I was going along. I had nothing written out. I had no, I had no idea why I was even going to the appointment. So he said, why don't you write it up and come back, and maybe we can find some money for you. I've been looking for that proposal because I think it was terrible. But the Markle Foundation, who was the person on the card, was very interested, and they gave us $250,000. The money came in, and I literally had no idea. And I, and I called David up, and I said, I just had a call that we have $250,000. 
And he said, you can't go and ask for money without discussing it first with me. And I said, why would I have to discuss it? If I didn't get it, you wouldn't care. And he, I said, do you want me to give it back? What I discovered was if you had a core group of people who really had the same ideas and the same feelings that you had about developing applications, you could do it. Sometimes we would goof, sometimes we wouldn't. But the idea really was to see how far could you go with this kind of technology. And I thought to myself, this is the, a harbinger of what's to come. I'm sure this is how things are going to develop. We're going to have smaller things. They're going to be portable. I said to David Oppenheim, we need a graduate department. And he said, why? And I said, because there's new technologies that are coming and we've got to be ready for them. And he said, well, tell me what you're talking about. So I described as best I could the fact that this was changing. And at moments of change, you needed to experiment. You needed to, most important, you needed to play. And that was critical. And they need, you needed to have an environment which would encourage people to try new things, get rid of the old standbys, and just begin to look and see what could you do. And at that moment in time, we received our first shipment of a small computer, which was an Amiga. It's long since gone. But I noticed on the Amiga there was a little sign that said, Video Out. And I thought, video on a computer? I can't believe it. And so we started to think, of what would we do with video on a computer? How would we add the computer? And things were just incremental. And in a very strange way, it wasn't that I had a vision that I got over there. It's just every day you put one foot in front of the other, and it, the answers presented themselves to you. I've often said the students designed the curriculum, not me. And then David Oppenheim called me to his office. I'll never forget it. And he said, I've decided who's going to be chair. And I said, well, I hope, I hope it's somebody I can get along with because we have to share this environment. Because the alternate media center really funded ITP at the beginning. And so he said, it's going to be you. And I said, no, it's not. I don't know how to run a department. I have no idea how to run a department. He said, you'll just do it. So I said, but how can I do it if I don't know how to do it? And he said, you'll figure it out. And I remember there was a meeting in the 12th floor of the library with faculty council. And I walked in with sneakers and blue jeans. And a very stiff-backed lady came up to me and said, excuse me, what is it, your business here? So I said, I've been invited to a meeting. She said, I don't think so. So I said, well, my name is Red Burns. Am I on the list? She looked down the list and she said, oh, excuse me. We thought you were a man. So I said, well, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. And I'm always surprised because I still see us as a little shtetl. <laughs> Sylvia Baruch once told me that she asked David Oppenheim what I did. And he said, I have no idea what she does, but when the, world, when the world is ready, she'll be there to catch it. It's art in a large sense, as opposed to art as art in terms of artful. And, and I'm reluctant to give it a name, but I think it comes as a result of this interplay, a very different sensibility. But if you're trying to create a new discipline, and you're, you're sitting on the heels of an old discipline, you really have to look at it very freshly. So what we did was we created classes that reflected the department, but were actually computer classes. And at the end of the semester, what happened was that we would say, the students would show their projects, and we'd say, you, you created a computer. And they'd say, what? And what happened was that we have a division called physical computing, which has been adopted by everybody around the world. It's really become a world standard. And that came out of our department. I don't think it's the Redburn's method. I think it's, I think it's really, it's just a really good place to be. It's lively, it's honest, it's engaging, it's playful. It's really the way education should be. Well, the thing about collaboration is that people in one discipline know nothing about this discipline, know nothing about another discipline. 
And unless you can hear and look and see, you don't get the value or the understanding of what that particular discipline does or doesn't do. And it occurred to me that what we really needed to have was an environment that took all these people from different places and to have the student body reflect that so that we somehow, because I didn't know any better, I wanted to take students from different parts of the world. And we got that done. It never occurred to me we couldn't do it. I think what marks my work here was nobody ever, and including me, thought we could do it, and I thought we could. It's the ability to listen and hear people from other cultures, engage in dialogue, engage in, in projects with very different ideas, and getting to know people, getting to understand them. And it's just a, an extraordinary possibility if we're ever going to have a world that we live in where at least we have respect for other people, we have to know them. And the global energy part of it is really very important. It's hard for me to believe that 30 years has gone by. It's still fresh in my mind, what we do. And the one thing I wanted to make absolutely certain of was, it was that we were, we were the most honorable. Absolutely honorable. And that comes up in decisions that you take every day, whether you cut a corner here or you cut a corner there. I never wanted to do that. If I had the chance to do it, I was going to do it correctly, or in my terms, correctly. The role of play and learning is probably one of the most important. And that is, if you're playing, you're not trying to do something or be something. You're, you're, you're engaged in the activity and in the playful, as opposed to how do you work it, how does it work, but just playing. And as long as you play, you don't feel anything's at stake. And so all your rigidity disappears. Because I always vis envision technology, not technology as the driver, but the idea as the driver and the technology to help you achieve that idea. And if we could get people to think that way, they would think about ways in which the technology could help people. We do a lot of work with assistive technology. That is technology that helps people who are disabled. We have a lot of technology that works with art. Technology is in every phase of everything we do. And so to learn it is a basic requisite. And there's not one place that doesn't use a computer. So it was a very simple idea, but it had to be t turned around. And then I've got a wonderful faculty and a wonderful staff. The, the people have been, we've been together for 20, 30 years. I think it's that I'm, I'm really from the bottom up and most people are from the top down. And I don't trust the top down. I think it's just the bottom up. It's the bottom that produces the stuff. The bottom ought to have the authority. And I think that's part of our philosophy. By that time, what I, what I really understood clearly, and which we, which we did, was to have an environment that was a very, very much a community. And to give a lot of freedom and possibility to students. So in a very strange way, students really were responsible for the development of stuff. They pointed stuff out. They came in with ideas. And they were part of it. And the fact is that lots of things happen if you change, but you have to be willing to change with the change. You can't go with the old models that we had and expect they're going to work with new visions. We help people by not helping people. We don't hover over people. It's hard to say when you see somebody struggling with something, they're struggling and you're around, but you're not, you're not giving them the answer. They're getting the answer. The minute somebody knows that they've got the answer and that they did it, their sense of self-worth just shoots way up. And to give somebody a sense of, of, of that kind of worth is really, I think, the critical thing for women. Women have always stood at the back. Women have always had this problem. Also, I think that I'm not, I stand front. It's hard for me to look back because every day I don't know what I'm going to do. It's not that I could sit here and read something and say, this is what we do. But 
if you walk on the floor, you'll have to come. If you walk on our floor, you feel the energy. And students push tables to the center of the space so that the way our space is configured is students are at the center and faculty and people are at the periphery. And they help each other when they're working on projects and they don't remember. And there's, there's all kinds of collaboration in that way. The students we accept come from very different disciplines. And the way we choose them, because we get more applications than students we can take, is that we find people who are from video, we find people who are from biology, we find people who are from business, we find people who... So they represent every discipline. And they're all, and they represent cultures. So you've got different cultures, you've got different, different disciplines. The place is just lively and people are just there excited all the time. And I guess basically for me is I created a place I wanted to be in. And so that's why every day is magic for me. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's 30 years and it's still magic.